Good morning. We are going to be continuing on part four of our series, um, The Gospel, Know It, Live It, Share It. And today we'll be doing the share it portion of it. Um, Real quick. Okay, we're working. Cool. Just making sure. So we want to be... We want to be followers of Jesus who are always ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ with gentleness and respect. That's it from 1 Peter 3.15. We want to be those kind of Christians who not only know it, really know the Lord, and then live it, but we also want to be ready to share it at any point. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today and talk a little bit of even maybe an unusual circumstance Um, where someone didn't look like maybe they needed to hear the gospel, but they did, and what the Lord did with that. Um, But first, let's pray before we uh, jump in. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for um, the sleep that we got last night. I thank you for the rest, just to be ready to um, face another day, Lord. I thank you for the uh, many things we'll learn today, the many things we'll learn, the, the rehearsals and the different ensembles. I just pray that all these things bring glory to you as we seek to integrate um, every aspect of our life um, under your lordship, Lord. And just give us, uh, open our eyes this morning and our hearts to be able to see your word in your name. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 16. We're going to be reading from verse 11 to 15. Acts 16. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So throughout the book of Acts, we see and we hear stories of both individuals, groups of people, and entire families encountering the gospel and then responding in faith to Jesus, to that gospel. Uh, Many of these stories illustrate the dramatic change that forgiveness brings. Um, sometimes we see a total turnaround. Someone is going a certain direction um, so far from the Lord that you never would think he could save that person, and he does that. He changes their heart right on the spot. And I have to trust that some of you in this morning may have come to the Lord this way. Maybe your parents or grandparents came to the Lord in that dramatic way. Um, even in this chapter that we're reading, right after it, there are two stories. The stories of a woman who was possessed and a jailkeeper who actually the Paul and Silas and the guys were able to break out of jail because of a supernatural event by the Holy Spirit. The jailkeeper was about to kill himself, and then the Lord made himself real to him, and he got saved. And those were two really dramatic stories that we see in the book of Acts. However, in the same section of Scripture right before, and the one we're doing right now, um, there's a woman named Lydia who Paul and his companions saw praying by the river. Um, and it's easy to brush by a story like this and say, well, she's a believer. She was praying. She knew who God was already. Um, but we're going to learn here in a little while that this religious woman actually didn't yet know the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior. And we're going to kind of see how, um, how Paul and his companions kind of identified her and led her to the Lord during this process. And she became part of the body of Christ. And so that's the main scene we'll be looking at this morning. So I'm going to go back and focus on verses 11 and 12. This is the context. This is the context of the passage we're looking at. So I'm going to read it one more time. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained there for some days. So this is the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey. His traveling companions and partners in ministries included Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And we can, imply, we can see that implication by the way he said we. 
And Luke is the author, it was the author of Acts, so we know that the we is pointing to Luke as being one of the individuals there. So earlier in the same chapter, God actually directed Paul towards Macedonia through a vision. And this was more of a redirection because they were going in one direction and God called them to go a different direction. And so God is specifically calling Paul and his co-friends and ministry partners to go to Philippi. So what is the significance of this location? First, I want to say that I, when I was looking over this passage, I seriously considered not looking at verses 11 and 12, which would have been simplified it a little bit, but I didn't want to take away the context from the passage. I thought it was important to know that God knew who needed to hear the gospel. When we think back to 2,000 years ago, we hear these names and these locations, and they sound like, oh, just one more of those big name locations um, from the Bible. But they were a real location with real people who the Lord loved. So I just bring this point up to say it was in God's inspired word to name the specific places where Paul and his cohort of ministry partners went. So I want to name them as well. So what was this area? It was a leading city in Macedonia and also a Roman province, what, which made it a pivotal location for commerce and influence. So God was obviously in his infinite sovereign plan looking to bring these guys to a place of influence to share the gospel. Things happened here where they were going. The Roman influence was strong, yet at the same time they had an autonomous government. The Roman government allowed them to still have their own autonomous government, which was important for the spread of the gospel. Um, and we also know that they were rich in copper, silver, gold deposits, a fertile plain. It was a wealthy city. It was a place of influence. God was leading Paul and his friends to preach here because these were specific people that the Lord loved. And in this story, we see a glimpse of God opening up the door to spread the gospel, and we see a glimpse of this today. So coming to Macedonia, and more specifically Philippi, that means something else. It means that God closed another door. So Paul and his friends were heading in one direction, probably praying about it, excited about it, and ready to spread the gospel as they were missionaries. And so the fact is, is that they faced a closed door. Yes, they did have an open door, but at the same time, they, had, they saw a closed door. Um, closed doors can hurt, but I want to say that God has a plan in spite of closed doors and redirections in our life. Um, and I wanted to ask you the question, has this ever happened in your life? Have you ever been totally on board praying for something and going in a certain direction and then realizing that God out of nowhere closes a door? It seems like it's going to happen and the door is closed. So... I would encourage you with that section of scripture there is that that is something that's been happening through the centuries and that's the way God works many times. He d sometimes we feel as if he's, we're sensing a direction, but God has a totally different plan and that's where we need to be flexible and see God's sovereignty in all things. Um, so if you're taking notes, our, we're going to move to verse 13 and 14a. The first point is God, the gospel is communicated. The gospel is communicated. Verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside. Better. It was good when I had a, a flipper for me, wasn't it? But uh, I got this thing now, so. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we, were supposed to, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had been there together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Tyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. So on the Sabbath, we meet Lydia by the river outside the city gate. Paul and his friends saw him. Most likely, what we're seeing here is Philippi did not have enough Jews to have a synagogue, as a minimum of 10 men were needed for that. So these women gathered together and called it a place of prayer. So on the Sabbath day, they were still gathering as faithful Jewish people. This group of women represented the Jewish population in Philippi, which was a pretty, pretty small number. More specifically, though, who was Lydia? Who is Lydia? Who is this person that Paul got to speak to? Well, it says here she was a dealer of purple cloth. Purple cloth. That's interesting. You might be wondering, what does that even mean? Why would we need to know this? Well, purple linen and cloth, they were a rare commodity and typically purchased by the wealthy. She probably had a very successful business, and because of that, she was an influential person. So right away we see the Bible, with their immediate context, would have immediately known that the purple cloth made Lydia probably a person who would interact with wealthy people and influential people on a daily basis. Um, she was from the city of Thyatira, which was known for purple cloth. 
um, from the history we know. And she was also a worshiper of God. That's where this gets interesting. So we know that they were sharing the gospel with a worshiper of God. So she was probably a Gentile convert to Judaism. She wasn't born a Jew, but she converted. Um, some of the commentaries that I read explain that she may have been a former polytheist, meaning she was worshiping several or many gods, and then ad adopted a monotheistic worldview after hearing about the God of Israel. So she, she followed the God of Israel. She read the Old Testament. Pretty much, Lydia was a good Jewish person who knew God, but didn't trust in Jesus as the Messiah yet. A good Jewish person who didn't yet trust in Jesus as Messiah. So in other words, she had a lot of things looking in her favor, but, and she looked good when she was praying by the river, but when it comes down to, apart from Jesus, we know that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through him. She was lost. Lydia was separated from a relationship with God through Jesus. And it would be really easy for us to skip over that, wouldn't it? Read, oh, she was praying. She's good. She doesn't need us. We're just going to keep on going to the next town. God must have uh, missed that when he told us to come here. Um, lost people don't always look lost. That's something for us to remember with our friends. Lost people don't always look lost. Just looking at someone and um, getting to know them a little bit doesn't tell you whether they know the Lord or not immediately. Um, who do you know like that? Who do you possibly know like that who you might think right off the bat, yeah, they don't, they don't need to hear the gospel, um, but perhaps they do. Just because someone attends church and has the look of a Christian doesn't mean they are. Doesn't mean they are. Um, it says here that Paul and his company began to speak to the women who were gathered there. I guess the implication we can take from that, because later on we're going to see what happened, it's implied that they spoke to gospel, since that was the sole purpose of their ministry. God was directing them through the, the power of the Holy Spirit to town to town where to go. So he was directing them to spread the gospel. That was their sole purpose. Um, they weren't there looking for a good conversation about the weather or the lo local chariot races. They were looking there to share the gospel. They were laser focused. Um, I wanted to do a side note here. This isn't part of anything. I, I didn't take this right from the scripture. Um, but these, this group of people, they were missionaries with a specific goal of sharing the gospel, and they were there for a short time. This probably would have been, if they didn't take advantage of meeting with Lydia and her friends there, they may not have had another opportunity. That sometimes happens for us. We encounter somebody who the Lord maybe leads us to share the gospel with on the spot. But most likely, you're going to have, most of the times you'll get to share the gospel are going to be relational opportunities with friends or somebody you meet. And hopefully you'll get a chance to build relationships with that person. And so um, that laser focus um, should be on our minds, but it doesn't always need to be the first thing that we share with somebody. That might sound counterintuitive to what I'm teaching today. But sometimes when, we need, when we're sharing the gospel with somebody over the long haul, um, we don't need to say it all at one time. Maybe sometime they need to see the fruit in our lives. If we know it, we need to be living it and then sharing it. And so there is a period of time sometimes where we need to just be living it before people and we'll get those opportunities to share it and have, have, an answer, have a time to give them an answer for the hope we have. So those guys needed to share it on the spot. You'll have opportunities to sometimes share it on the spot in a one-time meeting, but many times you'll have friendships over time where you'll get to do that. Does that make sense? Okay, makes sense. Okay, so my second point in verse 14b is the gospel was heard and received. The gospel was heard and received. Um, the short verse here is, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Simple verse. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what happened, what was said by Paul. So we see the Holy Spirit working in a special way in her life, opening her heart. And it's easy to miss the importance of what is happening in the story. The text, once again, I said this before, the text describes her as a worshiper of God, but what isn't mentioned here is that she did not yet understand the message of the gospel, kind of reinforcing what we said a few minutes ago. In this dialogue, God opened Lydia's heart to the gospel, to the message, um, and her heart was open to receive the good news that Jesus came to this earth, lived a perfect holy life, died on the cross for our sins, rose again to show us that the penalty has finally been paid, and, the come, and then to, to come again so that we would be able to also tell, talk about coming again so we would have hope of eternal life as well. So we need to be ready to share that message with someone. It's implied that that was the message that was heard. We don't see the gospel spelled out in words there, but we know that would have had to have been how Paul communicated. Um, 
campers, we all need to be ready to share the gospel. We all need to have know God's word well enough that we can share it, that it can just roll right off of our lips. Um, and sometimes that can be intimidating, right? To know that we need to be ready to share the whole gospel. We don't want to make a mistake. We don't want to say the wrong thing, so maybe we don't say anything at all. And so I challenge you to be so familiar with the gospel and the basics, even the very basics of what Jesus did, that we're able to share that story with somebody. For example, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was good. Everything God made from the very beginning in Genesis was good, and it was very good. No sin was yet in the world. Think about Adam and Eve, the, their, their minds and the things they were able to do apart from sin. It's amazing. No relational conflict, no pain, no sorrow yet at this point. Um, sin entered the picture through one man, Adam, and then his wife Eve. And ever since then, human beings have dealt with a sin nature. And we have all inherited that sin nature. And it hurts, doesn't it? I think all of us, from time to time, when we're honest with ourselves, could come to grips with that sin nature and realize that it's difficult and it's tough to live with that sin nature. But I also hope, we also know, we also know the truth that God sent Jesus on this earth on a rescue mission because as we struggle with sin day in and day out, 2,000 years ago, Jesus, God sent Jesus, his son, on a rescue mission to rescue us from our sin problem when we were unable to rescue ourselves. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, and now, now that we're believers, now that we have that chance, God wants to use us as his conduits, as his representatives, to carry on his mission until he returns to make all things new. And that is a summary, pretty much, of the story. It was all created good. We messed it up. God sent his son on a rescue mission to redeem us. He's in that process of redeeming us now. But even in that process, he wants to use us as his representatives to share with the lost world. And someday, he's coming back to make it all right and make all things new, and we're going to be part of that. So we need to be ready to share that gospel with other people. It's, it starts out with really good news. The news gets not so good and even really bad. Jesus redeems us, and it ends really, really good. And that is the message of good news that we need to be sharing with people. Back to our story. I imagine at that point when Lydia heard the whole story, because she knew part of it, right? She knew the Old Testament really well as a Jewish person. She knew it well, but the, her eyes were open to the reality of God's goodness to her. Her sin problem was redeemed through Jesus, not the sacrificial system of the law, but her, it was redeemed through Jesus, and now she had the hope of eternal life and God's goodness to her. Here's an evangelism principle here. So looking back at those dramatic conversions, I just mentioned, and if you read later, I'd encourage you to read those two dramatic conversion stories of the demon-possessed woman and then the jailer. Um, sometimes they're dramatic stories and they get saved right away, and it's just amazing stories. But we don't want to let the people on our radars, basically in our relational networks, that don't look like they need it, um, we don't want to miss them. If they, people appear to have it all together, but we don't want to miss them with the gospel. The change in Lydia's heart was a big deal, and it was as big of a deal as any other conversion we read about. So in the Bible, there's a lot of really big things. Think of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. It was a monumental one. It's one that we read about and talk about for the last two that we've been talking about for the last 2,000 years. But if you were saved, with, if, you were, if you grew up in a Christian home and God used this teaching of God's word in your life and heart over the first 5, 10, 15 years of your life, and that's how you heard it, and it wasn't dramatic, that is as big of a deal as, if, as what happened to Paul and what happened to the, what, the people we see in Acts. It's still just as amazing because you had a heart that was anti-God and apart from him, and he saved you and directed his heart towards him, and that is just as big, big of a deal as anybody else. The gospel convicts, the gospel converts, the gospel transforms, and the gospel changes everything. Um, and we need to be convinced of that if we're going to communicate the gospel clearly with people. We really need to look back at the gospel and be convinced that the gospel really changes lives, that the gospel really is important, that it really is powerful, um, if we're going to be communicating that with other people. 
we don't have to have all the perfect words when we communicate with people. You can make a mistake, and I don't think anyone's going to hold that against you. We need to be passionate about it, though. We need to know the truth and be convinced of the truth. People will know that as we share. So we have one more verse to look at, and that is verse 15. And that's going to be the last point. And my third point is the gospel is seen. The gospel is seen. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Or the NIV says she persuaded us. Makes more sense to, to me, and I think in our language. Um, Lydia and her household were baptized. Um, baptism is the visible sign of an inward reality. Um, many of you have maybe already been baptized to show the world that you um, know Jesus. Um, if you are a Christian and you haven't done that yet, I encourage you um, when you get back to your home church to look into that. Baptism does not save us, but it points us to Christ and what he's already done. It's a sign of what he's already done. Um, so they were, first they were baptized, and then we see Lydia starting to show the evidence of this, of this saving work in her life. And the way it showed her here was through her hospitality. Um, Lydia invites these men to stay at her house as she was practicing biblical hospitality. Um, that is something that we can do. I mean, most of you are, as, as high schoolers, you're not homeowners. You're not going to be inviting a group from church to come over to your house where you can entertain them. Some of your parents and grandparents and people might do that already. Um, so hospitality is something that is, is going to look different for you. Hospitality may mean that right here in Shehi, hospitality may mean somebody newer coming in and inviting them into your existing friend group. You might be really comfortable where you're at, really comfortable, and it's really maybe uncomfortable to bring anybody else in. But biblical hospitality would be bringing someone else into your group and saying, come hang out, hang out with us, come be one of us, and being open to that. Um, it might be ready to talk to somebody who needs someone to speak with at the end of a chapel time or end of a rehearsal or end of some time, it's looking out for someone who's maybe having a difficult time at camp and talking to them. Hospitality could be back at home, at school, um, being a friend to somebody who needs it. There's so many ways the hospitality can be seen. Um, then again, it could be something like asking your parents to invite some people over after church to be hospitable to them. Um, but it looks, it looks different for everybody. Um, but Lydia absolutely illustrates, illustrates this when she welcomes her brothers in Christ, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and Luke, to stay at her home. Um, but the bigger picture that I'm seeing here, the bigger picture that I'm seeing here is that ha looking at answering the question, how is the gospel seen in your life? In this particular situation, the Bible, inspired word of God, showed hospitality and baptism, how that was shown, shown here. But I want to ask you the question, how does the gospel, how is the gospel seen in your life now? Does your life at school and in your neighborhood display Jesus to the people around you? Um, you might know him and be learning to live like him. So how are you showing him to people and being able to communicate that as you share him with other people? <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about some implications for our lives with this passage. So the gospel, the good news that Jesus loves you and wants a relationship with you. Um, this is something that once you know it, you're going to have to pre you're gonna need to hear it preached to you, and you're going to need to preach it to yourself almost on a daily basis. Okay? We have a lot, all of you, um, campers, faculty, staff, everyone has a lot going on in their lives. And wherever we are, we have stress, we have pressures, we have temptations um, and trials in our lives. Um, a lot's happening here, and we need to be ready for it. Um, there's a high level, right now you have probably a high level of music being played and there's some, probably some pressure to do well and to rehearse and do well with that. That can bring on stress. Um, you need the gospel to remind you of who you are in Christ. No matter what happens, no matter what happens during this week in your performance, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you even more than, I mean much more, way, way more than how you perform. Think about your friendships here at camp. Um, no matter where your friendships and your relational situations are going this week at camp, um, at the end of the day, Jesus loves you and has a relationship with you or wants a relationship with you. Um, he is the most important thing. You are founded on the gospel. So no matter where your relationships and friendships end up this week, um, you are secure in the gospel and he loves you so very much. And we need to remember that. Jesus loves you. A couple other implications. 
So the gospel, um, you can't, this is, this is as we think about sharing, this, as we go home and right here even. You can't judge a book by its cover. We kind of talked about that right away. But you don't know who needs salvation by just looking at them. Um, it would be easy to pass by Lydia and think she was a believer. And there's probably people in your life that would be really easy to pass by and think they're a believer. But they might not. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope you have in Jesus Christ. Second point, God has no grandchildren. God has no grandchildren. I, I heard a pastor say this once and it really stuck with me. So physical life is passed on when we have children and children have children and, grand, and so on and so forth. But our spiritual lives don't work this way. Um, if you are in a good spot, if you are raised in a Christian family, you're probably at a place where you're going to hear the gospel more, which is a great blessing from the Lord. But that doesn't make you a Christian. Our salvation, our salvation is a decision that we need to come to on our own. As the Lord calls us, we need to be the ones that respond to that. Your mom and dad can't respond for you. Um, and it's at times in having my own son, my own two sons now, um, I think about that and like, I want to be able to respond for them and on their behalf do that. But that's an area of life where I'm going to have to give over to the Lord. And already I'm starting to do that, knowing that I can't make that decision for my boys. They need to come to that point. And it's the same for you. God has no grandchildren. Three, look at the people, look at people with a gospel perspective. So I want you to think about, if you've ever heard the parable with the four different kinds of soil, people are at all kinds of places in the process when, when, they come, when they're coming to know the Lord. Some people are, uh, are in the hard soil, the rocky soil, the soil, thorny soil, or the fruitful soil. In order to know where people are in that process, we need to get to know them and share with them effectively and directly as we get to know people. And so that's where relationships come in. I mentioned before that sometimes you're going to have those one-time or two-time opportunities to let, tell someone the whole thing in one spot. But many times it's going to be in relationships, as you get to know people over years even, that you can make that difference. Um, sometimes it does take years of, God's, of your example and God prodding them and moving them along through all different people to do that. And four, and I hope this is going to be encouraging to you, prayerfully share the gospel. So you can do all these other things, but eventually you got to do it. you got to get the words out of your mouth and actually communicate to them. And that can be the danger of relationship type, you know, over, t over the long haul relationship types of evangelism is that you get so comfortable that you don't actually want to say it. And so we need to be ready to prayerfully share it with people. Living out the gospel is important, but we, and we need transformed lives to effectively communicate it. It's important to show it to people as we also share it. But sharing the gospel clearly is essential every time. We have to use words. People need to hear the gospel through words. We can show it all we want, but eventually they need to hear it. So to do that, we talked about we need to be familiar with the Bible. We need to know the big story. Um, one of the ways I think about the big story that helps me in a couple stages if I'm sharing with someone, sometimes it helps me when you're sharing a lot of information, just have a couple couple markers in your mind. Um, a couple of them that I've read over the years is creation, fall, redemption, restoration. I'll say that again. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And that's a really easy way to understand the elements um, of it. I said that in not so many words in my explanation a little while ago. And lastly, be ready to use, use apologetic, apologetical tools. Christian apologetics, which is kind of a big word, can be summarized in two parts. Um, it's the objective reasons and evidence why Christianity is true. And so we're not just blindly believing in something just because it sounds good. Um, apologetics actually looks at the object objective realities and why we believe something to be true. And second, it helps in the communication of that truth to the world. At the end of the day, just because you can, you can use apologetics to show someone something's true doesn't mean they'll believe. If someone does not have a heart change, they're not going to believe regardless because they don't want to believe. Um, but it is a, a valuable tool. Apologetics is a valuable tool that we can have in our toolbox as we're sharing people and answering questions. So if someone comes to you with a question, there's nothing wrong with saying, I'll get back to you tomorrow about that. There's nothing wrong with that. No one's, no one's going to think, oh, that, that's not true because they don't know the answer right off the bat. Um, that's just not true. Um, we can use all the tools that God's given to us and the resources to look for answers. And sometimes you can say, I don't know, but I believe it's still true. So at the end of the day, um, that can be a valuable tool that we have um, 
But we need to prayerfully be doing those kind of things because that's what's going to help, help us guide us towards sharing with people the right way. And then lastly, I wrote once again, which I said a couple times, share it. Just do it. Get up and actually share the gospel with people. That can be the toughest thing to do, the toughest part of the process. So we need to just get out there and start doing it and share people the good news that we have. And let's make sure that we share it with the people who are like, you know what, we obviously know they need the Lord. Some people we need to do that too, but there's a lot of people in our lives that don't look that they need them, but they do. And so let's have our eyes wide open for those kind of people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we come to you um, again on this fourth day of chapel, um, thanking you for the gospel, the good news um, the good news of this rescue mission that you want on, came on to save us when we were unable to save ourselves, Lord. Um, we thank you that the gospel is not only for our justification, but also for our sanctification as we learn to be more like you on a daily basis and leading us right to our glorification. Someday, when all things will once again be new and perfect and all relationships, there'll be no more problems and no more sickness and no more death, Lord. We look forward to that day and we know that that's so much a part of the good news that we share with people. Um, Lord, we just ask you to give us um, an excitement to share this good news with other people and that people can see the passion that we have for you as we live, as we know it, we live it, and we share it, Lord. Just help us. Help us to do that on a daily basis, Lord. Um, we love you, and um, just help us this day. In your name, amen.